Pop Shield, a long-form discussion podcast about musical topics both past and present. I'm Gabe, and I'm joined as always by Dan. Hello. And Derek. Hello. So a few weeks ago, we received an email from Jackson, who writes, as you may or may not know, Pavement's bizarro masterpiece, Wowie Zowie, just turned 25. I think its anniversary would make for an awesome episode of Pop Shield. It marked a major turning point for the band, and some, if not many, fans regard it as their best album. While it's not my personal go-to Pavement LP, that honor goes to Crooked Rain, I enjoy and admire it the same way I do the Beatles' White Album. Would love to hear your thoughts. Thanks for the email, Jackson, and remember, you too can email us your topic ideas or whatever's on your mind at popshieldpod at gmail.com. Now, Pavement and Wowie Zowie are personal favorites of Darren and I. Dan less so, but we decided to make him listen anyway. (laughs) And it's a fascinating album for a bunch of reasons, not least its surrounding mythology. After the band dropped back-to-back classics with Slanted and Enchanted in 1992 and Crooked Rain, Crooked Rain in 1994, as well as a minor MTV hit with the single Cut Your Hair from that album, pretty much every music critic had declared Pavement the next underground band to take over the mainstream. But when Wowie Zowie came out in 1995, critics and fans were mostly disappointed and confused. So confused, in fact, that the prevailing theme theory came to be that the band sabotaged their own chance at stardom on purpose. Cut to 25 years later, and this difficult album is now widely seen as an all-time classic, though it certainly still has its detractors. I want to dive into all that reception and legacy stuff, but first, I think we ought to give Wowie Zowie a proper review. Let's start with our personal histories with Pavement in general, and this album in particular. Yeah, I um, like you alluded to, I, I, I've i never really liked Pavement, you know, I, I think I missed them when I was younger, and then they mm. just sort of are one of those bands that I feel like I didn't get in at the right time, um, you know, I, I, I just don't need another indie guitar rock band in my life <laughs> at, at this point, and so I, I feel like they, they, they passed me by. Interesting, but have you, like, listened to this album or checked out all their albums, maybe? I have listened to Crooked Rain and Slanted Enchanted. I don't think I had ever listened to this one. It didn't, like... Oh, wow. It didn't seem familiar. I, I feel like hmm. I probably have at some point in my life, but uh, not not at, at any point that I, I re- remember. Okay, what about you, Darren? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm having a hard time remembering exactly when I started listening to Pavement. Um, I think it was like late high school, probably early college years, um, mm-hmm. starting with Crooked Rain, Crooked Rain, and I pretty much fell in love with them right away. Um, just totally, you know, just one of those bands that you just kind of get obsessed with. Um, and I started with Crooked Rain and then found myself uh, listening to Wowie Zowie and you know, really, really liking those two and, and slanted and enchanted. Uh, I was a little slow coming back to, um, strangely, huh. I just never really clicked with me for, for quite some time. Okay. Um, yeah. And I guess for me, probably around the same time, um, you know, just got deeply obsessed with, with, uh, pavement in general. Um, you know, I'll say that I guess crooked rain was always my favorite. And then it would sometimes spar in my head with Slanted and Enchanted. Mm-hmm. And Wowie Zowie was always kind of like the other one for me, like the other, like the the number three pretty firmly, even though I, I came to love like pretty much all their albums, including Terror Twilight even. Um, maybe I was just like so obsessed that I you know couldn't get enough. But um, I, I guess I'll spoil it a little bit, but it's like, I remember this album being very dif- difficult at first. And then I started to latch onto certain songs we'll, we'll talk about, of course. Um, but it was like, for some reason, this week, I was just like, this is so fucking good. Like, this is my favorite Pavement album easily. Uh, I, I don't know why that is, but I wonder, Darren, did you have, like, difficulties at all with this album when you were first listening to it? You know, I feel like I didn't. Um, it's it's really strange that you mentioned what you just said, because, you know, in the previous episode, I, I talked about how Wowie Zowie was my favorite Pavement record, but after listening to it... I'm not so sure anymore. Um, wow. Yeah, it's really. I, I went back to Crooked Rain, and I was like, "This might be better," but I guess we'll get into it. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's start by trying to describe the sound of this album. Dan, let's let you, the first time listener, do the honors. Yeah. Um. I mean, like like uh, Jackson sort of alluded to in its in in his email. Uh. You know, this this is sort of like one of those white album kind of uh, grab bag. Uh, a styles kind of things you know i i I think it's all like based in like some pretty fairly like noisy indie rock um but not you know like 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 bordering noise rock but never really truly gets there but then there's some uh like 
western uh tinged <laughs> stuff yeah. you know some steel guitar um some some poppier uh indie rock songs some that go a little noisier you know more into the, the sonic youth almost sort of territory mm-hmm. and all um but it definitely sort of has that like a- eclectic um shuffle uh, ability <laughs> of a record like like we've t- we've talked about a, a lot like with with those white album kind of records that are um you know not not so uh not coherent you know what i mean or cohesive rather uh is what i meant to say yeah <laughs> yeah well maybe maybe coherent as well depending on who you ask um yeah how would you describe this album darren Yep. So, you know, if you're a fan of, of pavement, I think that there's some familiar territory, you know, I don't think that there's, you know, it's not one of these albums where there's just like a complete departure, right? I mean, there's a pavement sound, I think kind of like dirty guitar solos, you know, that indie rock sound, Stephen Malcolmus's voice, um, I think are still familiar. However, you know, in, in, in one of the, uh, articles that we read actually, kind of described it pretty interesting um coming from Stephen Malcolmus saying that the album is sort of like getting from one cool idea to the next right and that's mm. sort of a an interesting way to describe it because each song sort of has something of interest and they may not really relate to one another right like one song to the next may not really seem to you know not not that there's not a flow but it just you know you might just be jumping genres basically from one song to the next just like Dan had described i mean there's a steel guitar kind of out of nowhere and then there's a a very like grunge rock you know <laughs> punk rock sounding song right after it right um it's kind of all over the place yeah i kind of like jotted down you know i think there's there's an eclectic quality to this for sure but there are like a couple of like staple sounds sort of running through this i sure. think which is like you mentioned it dan like the kind of <laughs> almost like silly spaghetti western thing yeah. even though it's like yeah. not always <laughs> used it's not always used in a funny way but it's like it's got this kind of like knowing wink about it. Like, uh, Hey, this is kind of a spaghetti Western thing. Um, there's a lot of like really jazzy, like jazz pop kind of like verging into lounge music at times. You know what I mean? Like with this kind of these clean, like plucked electric guitars and this kind of like nice little soft rock groove to the baseline sometimes. Um, but then there's like punk, obviously that you mentioned, Darren, and another thing I think is really interesting is there is quite a lot of like jumping between these things within the same song, let alone, you know, song to song, like you said, um, which makes me kind of want to ask, like, <laughs> would you describe this album as like jammy or even proggy at all? I think it's a little jammy, uh, which I guess jammy and proggy are kind of the same thing. But, um, you know, it just it just has that feeling of like, it's not like they, they s- sat down and spent, you know, hours and hours and, and, and days and days on like a song. You know, it, it sort of everything feels like... Um, you know, like 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 it, it's spontaneous. I guess is the word I'm looking for, which is, is a jammy yeah. kind of thing. Uh, but I, I but I guess proggy. I don't really. I don't think I really agree with that because I, I think when you when you think proggy, you're, you're sort of thinking like uh, you know virtuoso technique. Uh, and and I mean certainly there's like a lot of guitar solos on this record, and I guess they're good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, you know, I I didn't feel it. You know, it wasn't like fucking Rick Wakeman shredding on the 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 keyboards or yeah. anything. You know, that's sort I, of what I think of, like, of with prog. <laughs> I think of like a philosophical difference between jam, you know, jam music and prog music, which is like prog is like calculated. You know, it's yeah. like you listen to like a Yes song. It's like you know, seventy two repetitions of this and then we switch to this you know what i mean like Mm -hmm. whereas jamming is it has a looseness i i almost feel like this has aspects of those because you know you feel like some of these multi-part songs like fight this generation or something has a like direction that's planned out you know what i mean like they're like three parts or something that they're going to move through in sequence and yet sometimes the transitions are like a little jammy like where it'll just sometimes like even just fall apart and just get noisy and weird for a second and then kind of you know what i'm saying darren like which which side of that do you see that falling more on or or do you think it's a little bit of both yeah i mean i think it's a little bit of both you know just taking a look at the the track listing and even like the lengths on some of the songs right i mean some some songs just don't you know they don't get to to that point where you would really think of like yeah you're jamming out right it like even though it, it sounds like it could easily go there, you know, I think of a song like Blackout, which is, you know, a song I absolutely love, you know, it sounds like it could, it could, it could have easily had gone three minutes, four minutes, you know what I mean? But it just kind of, 
ends um after two minutes but then you know like you had mentioned like uh, other songs have multiple parts they they make significant shifts you know it's 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 a little bit of both i guess yeah i just i just think it's kind of weird because if you think about 1995 like stuff that's kind of going on in that era but kind of on the fringes like not not really central i don't think to um you know the indie rock world is stuff like ween and fish you know getting getting very jammy in the 90s there but even stuff like sonic youth you know like their album from 1995 washing machine has like how long is that song like 20 minutes that last song you know like Mm -hmm. and and they were almost getting a little bit into it i I wonder if like you know the 90s is kind of the birth of like the modern festival circuit you know the first Lollapalooza (laughs) and stuff and Lollapalooza becomes like actually very central to pavements history like a funny story where they were supposed to play as they were blowing up but they had a little feud with Billy Corgan of the Smashing Pumpkins, and he said, "If they play, I'm not playing." So they didn't go until the next year, but it was you know a pretty big break for them. <laughs> I wonder, Dan, though, if you like, do you see them in in that kind of same world, like that Ween sort of jam, sort of weird, slightly Sonic Youth world? You know, I, I I'm a huge Ween fan. Uh, I don't know if I've really talked about that on the podcast much, but uh, I did sort of like when I was listening to this. I did sort of get like uh ween vibes a little bit um you know like like you said even with those uh some sometimes there's like the spaghetti western sound but it's always like there's a little like a little a little wink and a nudge yeah and like a wink and a nudge is is ween as a band you know like there so so many songs are like funny but maybe not you know n- n- nothing uh ween does is, is like 100 percent serious you know and and so i just sort of get that that sort of feel and i mean you know ween sort of has a, a similar story like having like a one weirdly big mtv hit <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. A, a, around the same time i think 92 if i remember remembering correctly um you know and so like it, it did sort of seem like a like a similar sort of path like a band that should not have been famous like at all um making like just sort of weird noisy um you know yeah jammy kind of thing you know ween's not a jam band uh but um you yeah, know they have some of those I know, bands that i know <laughs> <laughs> but you know like yeah i i definitely like i i was thinking that last night actually like they're uh they're a less good ween <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, it's it's just weird to think about. Like, I I ended up reading. Um, I think his name is Brian Charles. Wrote the thirty three and a third book on this album. And it's not because I always do like that much prep for a podcast. Don't get the wrong idea. Um, <laughs> I just like started glancing at it and like found it very readable and just like ended up finishing it randomly. But he was kind of observing like how weird the nineties really were, and I, I feel like I had never really appreciated. But like, it's weird that uh kurt cobain wearing you on his t-shirt was enough to get like a major label deal you know what i mean like that's how Mm -hmm. desperate major labels were to like sign the next big underground band it was like a frenzy yeah Yeah, and that's how you get like i mean what other fucking decade does ween get popular or even in pavement i mean no i mean it's nuts yeah i just feel like this album like it's i mean we'll, we'll get into the historical stuff and all that like them sabotaging or or not sabotaging but it's like doesn't it feel darren a little bit like this album is just like it's it sort of stands out obviously but it's like also very of the era like you shouldn't have given a a band like this this much this big of a platform because they were gonna make a pretty weird album yeah yeah i mean i i think i am inclined to it to agree it is i haven't really thought too much about this album in in the era that it came out and what everyone else was doing you know what i mean it's it's kind of weird like that and maybe that's like a good thing or a bad thing but like the album sort of in in my mind sort of transcends some of that you know what i mean it's one of those yeah that i yeah. don't think too much about the period that it's in i think that's that's uh fair um i did want to kind of talk a little bit about something that dan brought up a second ago which is like this this aspect of like a wink to everything that they're doing um i wonder darren if you kind of feel that I, to me i have the hardest time like talking about pavement because they they're like undeniably great but they feel kind of insincere about everything they do you know Mm -hmm. like i just i just feel like everything has like scare quotes around it you know like punk song you know what i mean like (laughs) they they didn't really like they don't like mean what they're saying on like a serpentine pad you know what i mean like when you hear them say like i don't need your corporation attitude you know what i mean like it's it's a joke it sounds like yeah, and it's like if an algorithm tried to make a punk song, like just putting things together, there's like, um, you know, like just the phrase, fight this generation. You know what I mean? It's like, 
it's it's mocking it a little bit. And I feel like they're mocking the Western vibe. They're mocking the loungy, jazzy vibe. I mean, do you hear like everything as kind of insincere, kind of a joke as well, Darren? Yeah, for sure. And I agree with you. I've always had a hard time talking about pavement in like a, in a serious way, you know, or trying to say that like they're one of my favorite bands or whatever because you know so much of their music and i mean this goes goes to like their their hit single cut your hair right where it just you know <laughs> how serious were they were they ever serious and and steven malcolm <laughs> right. just never really seemed like he cared enough to be serious you know what i mean and yeah so many of the reflections on this album involves talking about how he's sort of just mocking everyone yeah and mocking different genres and stuff and you know i don't know if it's like a flex that he's just like yeah i can write a punk <laughs> song yeah i can write a kurt cobain song you know yeah it's this is how I easy it is you know I think yeah. it's just like that's the most '90s thing. Like that, I feel like that's when sarcasm like really took off. You know, like that—that's sure. like a, a prevailing like sense of humor in like movies and stuff. It was just like the 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 decade of like it, it's cool to not care at, at yeah. all. And, yeah. and, and you know, so I think it, I think it like pervades into music. And maybe it's, I think started with with music like you know grunge i think is like known for that um and i think that comes from like uh you know earlier punk stuff that like you know wasn't actually famous until grunge and you know this definitely falls right in that you know ween same kind of thing i i think that is just like the like really quintessential like 90s thing now you know looking I know, back but it's, it's yeah I, weird, I think that right? i think like the difference is that like you know, Kurt Cobain wrote a song about... He's, like, dead serious. Well, he wrote... A, yeah, he wrote a song about deodorant, but the song sounds super serious, right? If you, like, listen to him in an interview, it sounds like maybe he wasn't so serious about right, it. But, right, like, right. Stephen Malcolm yeah, is... that's true. His music that's, doesn't sound as serious, you know what I mean? Like... Yeah, that's totally a good yeah, point. I just think yeah. of, like... You know, like, you listen to Cut Your Hair, you know, their, their, their minor hit, and it's, like, when they're doing, like, the... Ooh, 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 you know, you feel like they're mocking you for liking it you know what I mean? like you know you you actually like these stupid ooze and stuff and then like there are so many parts on this album where it's like you know something like and this is what i kind of want to like try to wrap my head around is like it feels like it gets actually very sincere and emotional like at points and then just keeps pulling back you know so it'll be like on oh i don't know like father to a sister thought right it's actually like a pretty mellow like kind of serious feeling song and then like at the end there's it just ends like on this silly riffage kind of and it's it's almost like you know oh you you thought i was serious you fucking idiot like you thought i actually was sad you know what i mean like Jeez. and then ju just like the 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 flow of the record like the way it's like you know you you get a song like grounded which i'm sure we'll talk about in detail but like very very moving and it's almost like Malcolmus is like we got to follow it with serpentine pad like we got to immediately do something like stupid you know like as quickly as possible lest people think we're being too sincere and so my question like darren is like i have a hard time explaining it again but it's like that push and pull is what makes it so like moving to me do you agree yeah, it's, you know, on the one hand, it's kind of nice to have music that's not forcing itself in its message or whatever, like forcing you to understand it or forcing you to come away with some sort of moving deep thing. Um, you know, and to be honest, like reflecting more on pavement, I, I've, I found myself realizing that, you know what, I never really thought all that much about like the lyrics or you know whatever like it's you know it, it just never struck me like the songs never spoke i guess to me in a way that it was like you should care about these lyrics like we're being so serious you know like mm -hmm. and so then the question's like well why do you like pavement right um you know a lot of it has to do with like the sound uh, you know for sure and then a lot of it also has to do with like it is kind of nice that like you're not being pressured or forced to like a certain you know, message or whatever, you know what I mean? Like come away with some sort of deeper meaning. Like it's, yeah. it's kind of liberating I mean, to like, listen to something and not have to be so concerned about that. Well, it's kind of interesting that Jerry said, cause to me, it's like pavement is, is so actually moving to me. Like they, they almost get into like the kind of nineties, like emo rock territory of like the promise ring or something at, at times, especially on crooked rain, I think. But 
there are these songs that they just get like very moving. And the way I rationalize it is that that kind of push and pull is like, it almost just evokes like this kind of burnt out feeling like this weariness, like you're, you're kind of like just feeling too directionless to care. Like he can't play the guitar solo well because he, you know, he's like too disillusioned or something like that. He can't write like serious lyrics because he's too self-aware or something. And like that kind of like, Oh, you thought I was serious thing comes to feel like a defense mechanism or something like just as he's starting to open up. I wonder, Dan, did you, do you, find pavement kind of emotional or sincere ever no i mean i'm not i i don't know like the the, the other two records like super well or anything uh, uh, but you know just this one no i i didn't really and i i, I think like i i kind of agree with uh with darren a little bit just just because it was sort of nice to like with with the like insincerity of the the lyrics and everything i just sort of felt like oh i don't really have to pay attention to what he's saying like whatever he's saying is interesting is insincere or is a joke or a wink and a nod or or whatever and you know we we always talk about it on this podcast like i I, most of the time lyrics just just kind of make things worse you know and and so it's sort of nice to not have to be like oh you know i'm getting preached to you know i mean i'm getting a political lesson here or you know uh, uh, some sad sappy thing you know it it is kind of nice to just be you know like you said like with serpentine pad like if that song was sincere it would be very cringeworthy but it's like you you listen to that in the context of the rest of the record and you're like oh he doesn't mean it it's just words you know or whatever he's right, being silly right. and it is sort of nice like I, you know i like that in lyrics when i don't really like when they don't really like um i don't want to say they don't matter but it, it's not part of like some sort of deep you know i don't i don't feel like i'm you know uh digging through you know some some big novel or something you know what i mean Diary. Yeah. yeah i mean i you know like i i feel like a lot of emotion when i listen to pavement and i i come to realize that like a lot of it is just myself like putting it into that or like just you know interpreting it for myself not necessarily feeling feeling as though you know father to a sister of thought is like somehow directing me in any direction it just you know it just sound it just has the sounds that i'm like drawn to you know what i mean like it whether he's mm-hmm. being serious or not doesn't like truly matter to me. Like yeah. I still love the song for what it is. You know what I mean? What it sounds yeah. like to me, I guess. I guess for me, it's like, I feel like there is this kind of like dichotomy here, which is like kind of pavements, uh, trademark, you know, cause you know, let's talk about like grounded for example, which is, you know, for me, it was like an early highlight. It was like one of the first songs on this record. I really latched onto. I think that's the case for a lot of people. It, it feels very emotional. It feels like a, um like if if explosions in the sky was like not as good at at their instruments or something like that because it's got this very (laughs) atmospheric like plucky high guitars and stuff and you know it's just like so on one hand i think like that that big bending like note you know over the over the chorus and everything is like it just feels very grand and moving and like so emotional and yet if it was not stephen malcolmus singing in his way it would probably be like a very sappy like overdone thing and it's weird because he's even saying a line like boys are dying in the streets but which should really sound stupid and shitty like i would expect like pearl jam to to write this song (laughs) that way you know but like because i'm not i don't think he's serious that again sounds kind of like an algorithm just like moving lyric goes here Mm -hmm. it it simultaneously like makes me laugh and makes me moved do do you feel that at all it may be just with this song darren yeah i mean you know i think the music it's itself has a lot of emotion in it right i mean just that like straining guitar that kind of like carries you between the the verses and stuff um it's something that like really draws me in right and keeps me keeps me interested the the boys are dying on the street just kind of you know i don't know it just floats on by it just, it just doesn't seem like you know stephen malcolm is as a lyricist is really not somebody who i have ever felt like i should take completely seriously or like feel like he's trying to elevate me in any way i know that sounds stupid yeah. but you know what i mean I, yeah i just i mean what do you think dan like it's it's weird how he seems to be like ruining the mood that the music is making and yet that combo yeah exactly to me is is like the best thing 
Yeah, I mean, because like you said, like if you just read these lyrics, like you know, go on Genius <laughs> and read them, you, I, I wouldn't want to listen to this song. You know, it does. It, it, right. it reads like a Pearl Jam song or something. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's that like. It's that wink and a nod kind of thing, and the the the, the music itself that yeah, it makes this great like um, dichotomy, like you said, yeah. Yeah, and again, I I feel like it's it kind of sums up like the irony of the '90s, like you said, Dan, which is like you know you think about something like I don't know, like the hipsters of of the '90s, and I guess a little beyond. Uh, the, yeah, they just like couldn't uh, let their guard down or something. Mm-hmm. You know, it was like so you think about like I don't know, like Beck's "Where It's At" or something, or a lot of Beck songs. It's kind of like dance music but you have to be like dancing is so dumb but like let's pretend like we like to dance uh-huh. you know what i mean yeah. like that's kind of how you're yeah. like having fun with it like isn't this stupid dj scratches suck you know and like <laughs> i feel like pavement gives you that like man ballads like weepy ballads are so fucking stupid but we get the same satisfaction from this without feeling like we're dumb you know what i mean i, I, I don't know it's it, it, it's weird and then there's also the aspect of like Oh, I lost my train of thought. Well, I, I have a question. Did you get anything out of, you know, the, the book that you had read, um, Gabe, about, like, Malcolmus's like, approach to lyrics? Like, anything, you know, it just, to me, it almost sounds like, like, the music comes first, and then he's like, you know, this sounds like a sappy song, so I'm just going to throw some, you know, lyrics that kind of match what I feel like is the mood of this. Yeah, I think that... The way he sort of described it in the the book, and the book is, I, I really would would recommend it if you're interested in this album. It's one of those things where, like, it's kind of like the author is writing autobiographically, um, which I know a lot of people hate when the 33 and a third books are like that. But he starts talking about, like, his process of trying to write the book, and that involves interviewing the band members. So then you're mm-hmm. kind of, like, just reading the interviews and stuff, and it's really, really interesting. Um and I think it's fitting because it's like him struggling to make sense of an album that like doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, yeah. But the um, and it also kind of captures that burnt out feeling, I think, because a lot of it is like he's like a struggling, failing writer, but he just feels like he really wants to write this book and his life kind of sucks and it just feels like this album. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, Stephen Malcolm, I don't know. I don't know <laughs> what to believe because the way he talks about it is like he didn't think too much about it or didn't think too much about anything. You know, he just seemed to like act like he just wrote down a lot of stuff and would just kind of like at random use it, you know, like depending on what, what they were doing, you know? So he would like act like he wrote down a couple pages of like thoughts and then, uh, like two paragraphs from that would just fit nicely in the song or whatever. So he would just do it, you know? Um, And he also kind of gives this impression of like not worrying too much about the, you know, the flow of the album, which I think we need to talk about more for sure in that, you know, they, they kind of like ask him like, you know, uh, why, why did you want it to end on like Western homes, you know, which is probably like people, I don't know, probably like the weakest song here. Um, it's a like spiral stairs wrote and sings this one and just seems kind of like a tough toss off ending. And he just kind of like, he's like, yeah. That's probably not the best song. It probably shouldn't have been on the album. Um, <laughs> God. You know, and like, so w- the sense you get, I think, from reading all the interviews is that like Pavement was kind of known for the quality of their B-sides. You know, one of those. That was also a really 90s thing. What happened to that? You know what I mean? Like, for sure. Radiohead and stuff. Yeah, and like, Nirvana, Nirvana. Yeah, It's like yeah. this yeah. like obsession on the, with the B-sides. Um, so the, the idea, I think, came to be like he wanted to make an album where you just put all the b-sides in the album you know so basically i think we should we should switch to the flow there which is like do you guys what do you guys do you think it makes any sense at all the way this album works the the the, like sequencing of it sequencing yeah yeah no i I, it feels like like literally they just you know took 18 songs put them in a hat and then you know (laughs) whatever order they pulled them out that was the order it it really doesn't seem like if if you change this much at all i mean maybe like you said when you have like a a somewhat serious song like grounded and then you put serpentine pad next to it you know it's like 
hey, just a reminder here, we're jo- we're joking around a little bit. <laughs> right. But, I mean, that even feels like that could just be pure luck that those, you know, ended up next to each other. It doesn't really, like, <laughs> that's kind of the only thing I can, like, point to as, as saying, as, as feeling, like, thought out. Because, I mean, I'm glad that he agrees, because Western Homes uh, is one of the worst closers on a record <laughs> I, I've heard in a, in a while. <laughs> Yeah, you know, in speaking of B-sides, like you had mentioned, Gabe, I was sort of astounded to see that, like, on Spotify, the most popular, pl- the most popular played pavement song is Harness Your Hopes, a hmm. B-side from Brighten Your Corners, I think. Um, wow. Really weird. Anyway. Um, it was on a show or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I guess so. Um, so. So, I think in one of the interviews I had seen, um, he said that you should shuffle the album like that's how it should be played like you should just shuffle right. it so i i so, did that so let a me clarify times. that in the the quietest interview it starts or the quietest re- retrospective on this album it says yeah. that in an interview with rolling stone um Stephen malcolm has said that it was designed to be listened to with the tracks randomly shuffled i couldn't find like you know the 90s rolling stone thing i guess it's not on the internet but um to me, that's weird because shuffling didn't exist. That's what I was thinking because because I read that too, and I, I was I, I can't I honestly can't remember, and I guess I could have googled it, but I'm too lazy. Um, could you shuffle a CD? I, I like yeah, cannot, you could shuffle. You a could CD. shuffle a CD. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But, I remember having okay, yeah, okay. but but ninety but ninety five is still kind of early for the CD. Like sure, it just sounds a little dubious. And this and this is what I was gonna like try to mention is that I don't really trust Stephen Malcolmus. Like yeah, on any yeah. top, on no song do I trust him what he's saying if he's serious <laughs> or not, uh, and no interview do I trust him at all. Like I think I, I just suspect that he actually like really wanted to put Western Homes at the last tr- you know who knows why, but mm-hmm. um, but I just doubt that it was like that you know laissez faire and it was like I'm sure the lyrics were thought out and stuff too to some degree, but um. But yeah, you were saying, Darren, that you you actually went ahead and experimented with this. So how yeah, did, so how I tried I tried shuffling it a couple times, um, and you know I think the quietest uh, you know retrospective sort of talks about how like the song structures sort of um, you know lean themselves into this idea of shuffling, where it, it you know songs are not necessarily like bleeding into each other, right? Which mm-hmm. would really make a shuffle difficult, um, right? And it, it almost feels as if every song kind of comes to a satisfying ending, like a satisfying conclusion that like whatever came next would be fine. And surprisingly, yeah. I found that to be true, like shuffling this record, like it, it really felt like it didn't matter where I was at in the record or what song was coming up next, because whether I listened to it in sequence or I listened to it um, on shuffle you know that that feeling of like a song ending and the and then the next song coming on for this album it kind of felt the same like it it really didn't seem to change anything good or bad yeah i was gonna ask like did it i mean was it like illuminating new aspects of the album not necessarily because like like, you know there's certainly i mean for somebody like myself who has like listened to the record like so many times right right? right. there's there are some songs where i'm like kind of already anticipating what the next song is going to be um so in my head it was kind of a little bit weird but as far as like listening experience like it wasn't really that bad i mean it, it it seemed as if it didn't matter whether i was shuffling or listening to in sequence like the songs just kind of like live on their own and not necessarily like talk to one another you know yeah, I mean, for me, it was like, I was really intrigued when I read that. And I was like, damn, I got to try that. You know? Right. Um, and I found like there were there were times where I was like, yeah, this totally works. I don't know if it's like bringing out new meanings or sensations necessarily. Mm-hmm. But then the more I did this, the more I realized that I, I, I just think that Malcolmus is maybe full of shit, like pulling our, <laughs> our chain a little bit here because... You know, there would be times where it's like I would get hit with like, you know, something like grounded, blackout, father to a sister of thought, grave architecture, you know, like three of the, me- you know, like five of the mellow <laughs> songs, like in right. a row or something. And it becomes like a real kind of sappy, like weep fest to me almost. Like I, I really thinking more about it, it's like, to me, it's really sequenced in like a very logical way. It kind of like basically, you know, every double album, and I know this isn't technically a double album, but it kind of plays like one. Um, 
has these, you know, it's, it's built around like anchor songs. You know what I mean? Sure. Like, um, every side of vinyl usually back in the day would have like these kind of the masterpiece type things. And then the little like gems kind of filter around it in a way. Um, you know, the white album works that way. The wall is like very clearly structured to have like, you know, one like knockout song per side and stuff like that. Um, and to me, you can look at the track listing and anything over like a minute and a half, you know, is one of these anchor songs, basically like these four minute fully developed songs. And you can see that they're spaced out like pretty perfectly. You know what I mean? Like they come every once in a while. They're usually followed by some like weird punk joke freak out. You know what I mean? Like to kind of shake things up. You just feel like when you get to like Flux Rad or something, he's kind of like, we need one of these right now. You know what I mean, Dan? Yeah, I do agree uh, with that a little bit. I, I was looking at the track listing, like on Wikipedia, with the times, and yeah, it, it does seem intentional, at least that like the you know there, there's there's a handful of these like a minute, you know, less than two minute long songs, and none of them are right next to each other. There's like at least two tracks in between, or except yeah. for one, there there's there's one track in between, you know, uh, and that does sort of seem intentional, you know, because y- you kind of don't want two of those really short songs back to back that that's sort of like i i feel right. i feel on a record when when you have that it, it, it sort of comes off like um like you're padding the record like like you've got uh, you know incomplete ideas and uh when 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 you put them all together i think it makes it more evident whether it's it's true or not you know it just i, I think when you put them together it, it shines it in your face and so to to, to to like separate them like this i i think does uh speak uh, uh to, to being a, a choice but it just doesn't seem like it actually matters that much like if you shuffle this record i don't think you're gonna i don't think you're gonna come away with a uh a mighty different you know maybe like it, yeah, like if yeah. if you kept those one minute songs you know kind of separated and then you you shuffled around the the four three minute songs yes i don't exactly, think that, yeah. exactly like i don't think it yeah, matters think- where you know motion suggests and, and you know best friends are you could you could switch those you'd be fine you know, or whatever. Yeah, I, I do think some of the types could be swapped in that way. Like Pueblo feels like kind of grounded part two. They're both built around like these soaring, you know, piercing high guitar notes and stuff mm-hmm. and quite epic in scale and stuff. And to me, they're like very deliberately on opposite sides of the album. Um, you know, if they were back to back or pretty close to each other, I think it would get ridiculous quickly. Um, but you could probably flip them, you know, mm-hmm. as long as they stay in that kind of same place. But on that note, you know, I, I just personally feel whatever whatever the fuck Stephen Malcolmus wants to say that like Western Homes like has to end the album. It has to end on like a shitty joke song because it's just the spirit of this album that it's not going to end on an, like an epic, you know, grounded style or something or not even like a guitar solo rock freak out like noise freak out thing like Half a Canyon. It's got to end on a silly thing. Are you sympathetic at all to this, Darren? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that that's pretty much exactly right. You know what I mean? I think it's intentional that like you stick a song like Western Holmes at the end. And you know, like one of my gripes is really not even to t- to talk about like the fact that this album doesn't have a great closer. You know what I mean? Because it just doesn't feel like an album mm-hmm. that needs one, right? Like, um, I've never really, I've never liked western homes like that much like it's never been like my favorite track i've never really it's not one of these albums that i'm like i can't wait to get to the end right we talk about this about certain right, albums right. where like the ending is like oh you can't wait till these last three tracks it just brings the album to a close wowie zowie just isn't that like i'm not I, i'm true. more interested in everything in between than i am in like the ending you know what i mean like, there was many many times when i listened to this record in full where i was like you know, oh, I'm at the end. Like I'm, I'm ready to go. Like let's restart it. You know what I mean? Like I want to kind of go through the album. It that's it's like it's one of those things where it's super stupid to talk about, but it's like it's more about the journey than it is the ending. Or whatever, <laughs> you know what I mean? No, I I agree with you. You know, like I, I I'm not the biggest fan, and I, I didn't fall in love with the record or anything. But it it wasn't like I I wasn't always like oh you know waiting for that big payoff or or whatever. It, it was sort of a, a record that like. You know, a lot of records, I, I I always like try to listen to like a full album, and and this one was like one that I didn't feel too too bad if I you know was was 
cl- cleaning up some shit in the yard and you know i was only out there for 30 minutes and, and i listened to 30 minutes of the record instead of all 50 you know six or whatever it is i, I didn't like feel like i was l- missing out or or like leaving something you know yeah. like i was watching half a movie you know it it, it was <laughs> right. it was it was fine it was like if you got a 30 minute task to do to listen to 30 minutes of the record uh you know and it, it, there's something to be said for that you know i, I prefer a, a a cohesive you know piece but but i mean you know, there's a time and a place for everything that is that is a good point actually because I, I did find myself often like kind of just like quitting based on when i had to do something not that there's like a lot that i have to do yeah. in the <laughs> quarantine era but um but you know it would be like i would just start where i where i stopped like the next morning or whatever and it it was like just just fine yeah it's fine yeah. Um, <laughs> exactly on that note though let me ask you both about um and we'll uh, you know we'll maybe get into some of like the individual songs that we haven't talked about yet but like the the first song we dance is really a fan favorite um i think just objectively like a weird way to start an album because it's kind of like a soft acoustic guitar number you know, I wonder, but it feels purposeful. I wonder, you know, why that song? Why does it start? Is it purely just like to get you used to the nonsensical arrangement here, or like, what do you guys think about that coming first? Yeah, I mean, like I said, I, I I'm not like a big Pavement fan. I haven't listened to those other two records in years. I I intentionally like didn't listen to them uh, again like before this or anything. Uh, um, so you know, it it to to me, it didn't like really stick out as like being super strange at first, you know. And then I like after listening to the record, I kind of get it, you know. Oh, you know, we're coming in with the with the acoustic ballad or whatever, you know. There's there's another one of those wink nudge kind of things right there. Um, but I guess like with with you guys, like is is it so much different from Slanted and Enchanted or or Crooked Rain that that it really strikes you as like odd or? I mean, they both start out with bangers, wouldn't you say, Darren? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I will say that We Dance, like, I feel like is so, like, it, it, there's no other song I could think of on this record that would be better <laughs> sure. to start the record off. And I'm going to tell you right now, like, when I shuffled the record, I started with We Dance oh, every nice. time. <laughs> I just, I just couldn't, I just couldn't, because I'm like, I can't imagine this song anywhere else on the record. Like, I just feel like it's Interesting. a weird, like perfect introduction to this like very weird album yeah yeah i do think it like kind of sets your expectations you know like not to have any expectations <laughs> basically just like exactly you know you're just like what is this and especially because like pavement doesn't really do like i mean it almost sounds like in the beginning like it could go into like a campfire performance <laughs> of like pink floyd's wish you were here or something yeah. you know what i mean like and and the way it goes obviously is like pretty weird but it it just it just is like very arresting um on that note though we we've talked a little bit about the lyrics but i wanted to kind of like maybe just spend a, a minute more on them you know like to me they are i would describe them as like pretty surrealist kind of sure. or like mm-hmm. kind of like a it reminds me of like william s burroughs or something where everything is like kind of a joke and it's just flowing like nonsensically um and it's very i don't know i've 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 mentioned that it's sometimes moving despite itself but it's often like very funny so on we dance right like pick out some brazilian nuts for your engagement check that (laughs) expiration date man it's later than you think i don't know like why that's so funny to me and there are like many other lines here that just like what does he say from the rough we get par you know like this boast that is just so badass um (laughs) or like even musically like on a grave architecture you know it's like kind of the loungiest song there's like a just pure like um dueling guitar solo there's a lot of like guitar interplay and stuff and they're both hitting so many bum notes that it's just the funniest fucking thing ever um so to me like the lyrics i feel like a lot of people say this um about a lot of people but to me like steve malcolmus is the closest thing to the 90s bob dylan or something where he just feels like so much smarter than me that like I sh- I should just I-, I should just laugh even though I don't fully get it. You know what I mean? Like like when like when Bob Dylan says in Tombstone Blues, like the sun's not yellow, it's, it's chicken. chicken. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, that's not funny, but I I should laugh anyway because Dylan said it. You know what I mean? And like that that whole Brazilian nuts expiration date thing, I don't know why it's funny, but it like you, you know what I'm saying? There's kind of the aloofness to him. Yeah, I mean I I, I definitely thought that like 
I, I don't know if you read it in that book or anything, but I, when when I was listening to this record, I, I thought about like the cut ups thing, you know, which Burroughs was famous right. for, and uh, Bowie used a lot, and you know, uh, uh, tons of people have used it. But like, I I thought about that. Like, I wonder if he was doing that at at at, at some point in these songs because yeah, they have like a surrealistic quality, but it's like you know, you could tell like a, a sentence went together or so, you know, right? Uh, you know, like because that Brazilian nuts thing, like. It like it it sort of makes sense, you know. It, it's not like it's not like just complete like, you know, just random words or something. Like it, like it's it's a, it's a group of sentences that like you sort of understand what he means, but like when you yeah. when you look closely at it, it actually doesn't really make any sense at all. You know, it's at least it's not like the way you would say, uh, you know, what, right. what, what he's trying to get at. Um, so yeah, I, I thought about that. Like, I wonder if he did do the cut ups thing. Yeah, would you add anything to that? Do you see the Dylan comparison at all as far as the surrealism, Darren? Mm. Or the funniness, the funny surrealism? I don't know. Maybe the funniness, yeah. Um, you know, we we kind of, like, talked about this a bit, but, like, I just never really took Stephen Malcolm's like, lyrics seriously, you know? And, um, I don't know, like, Bob Dylan lyrics are just different you know what i mean like yeah but i i think i think gabe has a good point like you know dylan lyrics like like highway 61 era you know like tombstone blues like those you don't right. take serious like that's like after you know obviously like times they are a change in or, or you know free will and era like they, they you know take those ones serious but you know blonde on blonde you know bring it all back home uh you know highway 61 those are all sort of like when he's got this surrealistic like yeah, I think sometimes doing that, that like John Lennon, I'm the walrus thing where he's like purposely saying things to get people to, yeah. to like look into them and like think there's some deeper meaning, but really it's just bullshit that he, he made up, you know? Yeah. To me, it just seems like of the same piece. Um, on that note though, I want to single out a song that is another big fan favorite, um, Kennel District, which is another Spiral Stairs song. Um, and he sings it and you know, to me, it's it's so odd because it's basically like just a pure, completely unironic, you know, just totally sincere, like joyous indie pop song. You know, it sounds kind of like Dinosaur Jr. or something. Sure, yeah. Um, it just sounds like if you were reading, you know, Naked Lunch, and then there was like a, I don't know, like a Hallmark card like in <laughs> stuck the in the middle for some. <laughs> yeah, just like all of a sudden the most like sincere, straight thing. Um, what do you make of this song, Darren? Is it like a personal favorite of yours? Do you see it as standing out that much? Um, no. I mean, it's not one of the one of my favorite songs on the record. But I mean, you you basically like hit it perfectly when you said it's it's like a dinosaur junior song. Um, and I mean, it's a, it's a cool song, but uh, it's to me, it's one of those ones where it is it, it's sort of like clearly them just trying to sound like something else or like trying to produce just like a yeah, this is just a dinosaur jr song and move moving on you know what i mean it's not one of the ones that have ever really stuck with me over the years i think it's like a really great song but it's a sure. good example of like because it's got the ooze and everything yeah. on the hook but they don't feel like they're mocking you it doesn't feel the same as cut your hair it feels like actually sincerely just trying to be as catchy. right right like really sticking to the theme right yeah and to me, it just like it just kind of draws out this contrast, like how different Pavement actually is from their indie rock peers in this way. Did you did this stick out to you at all, Dan? Uh, not really, but you know, I mean, I, I'm not as 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 versed in the record as as you guys. You know, I've I've had two weeks of experience with it, where you know, so <laughs> yeah. so no, it didn't it didn't like particularly stick out. It's someone else singing though, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's the spiral. He has a real name. Spiral Stairs is his nickname. I don't, uh, I don't okay. remember his. Scott something. Yeah, you keep Scott saying King. that. I didn't really know what I meant. I didn't want to seem like a pleb. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's just uh he's just like the he didn't write a lot, but he wrote a couple. It's like a Ringo situation. Oh, Malcolm okay. gives him a couple, you know. Um <laughs> but uh but yeah, I mean to me that's just it's like an interesting album that makes you realize how weird the rest of the album is, how normal that is. You know, it kind of works like you know the Beatles like to do that. They'll put like a when I'm 64 kind of a thing in the middle of Sgt. Peppers, yeah. and it just makes you feel like damn like those other songs are, are way weirder now um so i think that's really interesting were there any other like um you know highlight songs that you guys want to talk about specifically uh, i liked at&t uh, a bit i, I it is mm. really like reminded me of like a violet femmes uh song 
Uh, oh yeah, band right. I like you know he does that like stuttering kind of like singing yeah, in it that yeah. like you know whatever the guy in Violet Femme's name is does a lot. Uh, so <laughs> so I dug that one and I I liked uh, and I see y- y- that people don't always love this one, but uh, I like Flux equals rad. I guess is how you'd say. Yeah, yeah I like yeah. that song. I mean, it, it it's like sort of the most noisy. Uh, you know, it sounds like a Bleach era Nirvana to me. Yeah, and Bleach is my favorite Nirvana record. Um, <laughs> and, and you know, yeah, it, it, it sort of had like that really like sort of noisy Sonic Youth sort of thing. Um, yeah, yeah, and, and yeah. So uh, I, I I dug that one a lot. Um, yeah, those those are two of my favorites. I think. Yeah, I mean, I I agree with you, Dan. Actually, AT and T is probably one of my favorite um, songs on the record. So, kind of one of the first ones that I really loved a lot, and kind of always, always really liked. Um, and it it just kind of you know goes goes into the sort of comedy or whatever, like joking, I guess. But it at the same time, it's still like a, just a really great like driving song. You know what I mean? Like, um, yeah, yeah. Something you just want to like shout it at the top of your. Yeah, 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 yeah. For sure, for sure. Like I, I, you know, and whether I don't know, it's just not a song that I'm like too concerned about whether he's being serious or not. Like I just think that there's yeah. enough there to like not worry about that. I guess. And isn't um, it like such a '90s thing to name a song like AT and T, like right. uh, <laughs> yeah, a big exactly. corporation? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, I wanted to kind of. Um, mention you know there are some songs it's like another example of what i was talking about earlier um i think this is where i lost my train of thought earlier which is that you know like on half a canyon or something or like uh the second half of fight this generation or even like best friend's arm a little bit with that like really distorted bass it gets into like kind of a doomy territory you know what i mean like quite heavy especially on half a canyon when he's like screaming you know like in this distorted mic and the guitar is like absolutely destroyed with distortion it's like so buzzy and fucked up um and it, it it's like another example of just like the kind of ballads where if this was done by a different band you know you could imagine them like taking it really seriously you know what i mean like like a sleep or something like that you know that kind of a band like they could they could play the same like doomy blues riff on half a canyon and make it into something else entirely. But Malcolm is like screaming and shredding over that. <clears throat> it, it, it just feels like kind of funny or a joke, but kind of interesting as well. Um, and on that note, I wanted to kind of talk, especially to you, Dan, about the quote unquote shredding on this album. Like I said, a lot of guitar playing, a lot of guitar interplay between the two guitarists, a lot of solos and stuff. What, how did you feel about it as a known guitar solo hater <laughs> <laughs> i mean uh, like you said like it, it always sort of has like this this wink and nudge you know characteristic to it there, there's a lot of like bum notes it's not like virtuosic <laughs> yeah. uh guitar soloing which that's like what i really i, I hate like virtuosic like playing of anything basically you right, know right. like it, it's just it's just boring uh so it didn't bother me like too too much could i have done with less certainly Um, And I think that, like, honestly, that is, like, a reason why, like, I've never come to love Pavement. And, you know, even after this two weeks, you know, this is a record. It it was fine. I I didn't, I didn't, like, particularly mind listening to it. But it wasn't, like, something I was, like, dying to put on every day. And I think it's because, like, I, I just... I, I, I got enough guitar bands in my life. I, I, I just, I don't, I don't, I don't really need a new one. I, I, I just, I really can't remember the last time I, I found, like, a new, uh, super guitar oriented band like this that i that i fell in love with and i i just feel like it's passed me by you know i am just came mad i'd really love i'd love to know what that list is because i feel like every time we talk about a guitar oriented band dan says the same thing where it's like i don't need another another one yeah i got enough i got enough of (laughs) them in my life pretty much like he's okay with it if it's something he already knows but if it's like he just he he is not accepting applications (laughs) exactly yeah yeah, yeah. guitar band Uh, where we're closed right now we're fully staffed uh you know the economy's going to shit where we've got no (laughs) room for you (laughs) <laughs> well well what did i mean like because Darren, we didn't talk about rattled by the rush which i think is an obvious highlight and like really kind of a guitar vehicle but like you said dan a lot of bum notes um there are a lot of points where it's like he'll just stop playing you know and it's like kind of just the rhythm section going and it, that's like the part where you know a jimmy page would start picking up steam <laughs> you know what i mean but he's just like not not going anymore i guess he's done with it um no i it's a lot of like ant 
anti solos i guess i would call yeah them. i'm kind of glad that that song was early in the record because it really like getting like putting this on for the first time i i i was worried that it was going to be like just a real sh- shitty guitar record and then you know when you hear right. that and you hear those like you know bum notes and it's sort of aborted solos and stuff it is like okay at least like we've got uh you know we we, we know what we're doing here it, it's not some virtuosic you know bs it, it, you know it, it it gave me like the confidence to 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 deal with it the rest of the time <laughs> Yeah, so how do you feel about the shredding, Darren? Yeah, I mean, I've always been personally a huge He fan. is taking applications for new guitar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he definitely is. He definitely is. I've always been personally a huge fan of, like, the pavement sound and, like, the way they handle solos. I mean, it's not just this record. Like, they do it on every record. Um, yeah. And as somebody who had played guitar and somebody who was never really, like, classically trained, I certainly appreciated the idea that, like, you know, a solo doesn't have to be Jimmy Page level or doesn't have to be, like, incredibly, you know, perfect and, and sound amazing and shred. You know what I mean? Like, you don't have right, to do that. Right. Like, you can make it messy and, like, dirty and, like, you know, lazy, like, stop playing, whatever yeah. it is. Like, it, it's like, just... Like, uh, Smells Like Teen Spirit. You can just play the verse. And it, it can <laughs> yeah. be awesome, you know? <laughs> right, exactly. So, to me, it's very inspiring. Yeah, I think it's cool because it is It is actually, like, you know, we're, we're acting like it's pure fuckery and silliness, but I think it actually is kind of like an innovative use of guitar, it would be a more accurate way to describe it. Um, you know, the first pavement song actually that like hooked me um, was the last song on Bright in the Corners for some reason, Finn. Yes. Um, yes. Yes. It has this like absolutely breathtaking guitar yes. solo at the end. Like the last like three minutes or something are just yes. shredding. But it's like, it, it's very fucked up, tons of bum notes, like just all over the place and yet it's like incredibly climactic and moving and emotional again it has that kind of feeling of like i am too emotionally devastated to play this stupid guitar right or something like that you know (laughs) and so i get a lot of those feelings here and sometimes yeah they are used so melodically and so interestingly um but again it's like that the the scare quotes thing you know it's always like here is a quote-unquote solo for you idiots. You know what I mean? And I, I don't know. I, I I appreciate being uh, made fun of like that. Um, what about the you know any low lights on the album? I want to kind of we we talked about them for sure, but like a lot of people who don't like this album or feel kind of divided about this album, they they single out the, some of the songs we mentioned, like Brink's Job, Serpentine Pad, Flux Equals Rad, um, as just kind of like sucking. You know what I mean? Like. I what do you there, do you what do you think about these songs and are there any other low lights for you? I definitely agree with Serpentine Pad. Like that was the most like um in your face a joke song I felt like. <laughs> um the the backing vocals on it are so fucking annoying. Like whatever <laughs> yeah. voice he's singing in. Like that song really gets on my damn nerves i i didn't like that one at all and i really didn't like the closer western homes i, I hate that like sort of watery uh yeah vocal yeah. vocal effect I, I hate that like in any music basically i don't i don't know if he was using it as a joke here <laughs> but it's not a good one um yeah I, I those those are my least two favorite songs like by far I mean, I disagree. I like, I really like uh, Serpentine Pad. I think it's like, I kind of do too. I just think it's think hilarious. It's like, it, would, it's like... <laughs> it would be like one of the better, you know, like Clash songs or something, or like <laughs> one of the better Sex Pistols songs. It's just like actually a cool punk song, but then really funny. Right. Right. Like, because clearly they're just not trying, you know, like on the backing vocals and stuff. Like, it's just, it's just funny. Yeah. It was but, just um, like too yeah. overtly silly for me, you know? Like, it yeah. was too yeah, obvious yeah. they weren't trying, you know? Yeah, I mean, and I, you know, I, I kind of agree with the assessment of like Brink's job. Like, it's not really one that I'm like huge on, but like to me, it just kind of like moves on. It just moves the album along. You know, it's it's a minute yeah, and a half yeah. or whatever. Yeah, it's fine. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the of the tracks that like Stephen Malcolmus is not really like singing on. To me, it just doesn't uh, like. You know, it just doesn't uh, seem to fit in. You know, we talked a little bit about yeah. Kennel District and everything, but it just. It almost seems like there's n- nothing funny uh, or silly. Yeah, it's true t- about that song. It just seems totally serious, and it just feels weird. You know what I mean? Like even um, was it is it half a can or no? Western horn, 
Holmes. Is he sing on that too? Like Stephen Malcolm? No, he does. That's the one with the like weird psychedelic. Right. It it, it, it almost movie. feels like a B side that like just doesn't belong yeah, yeah. on the record. You know. No, I honestly the first time I listened to it, I checked to see if it was a bonus track because I really did think it, <laughs> right, it right. was. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I sort of mentioned that I feel like it needs to end on one of the weakest songs because it's just like perfect for the album for some reason. Um, and and I also kind of mentioned that like Kennel District, it's so normal that I feel like it elevates the rest of the material and like kind of serves an important function. On that note, I, I just feel like I don't have a single low light. I just think like every song is so great. I It's one of those albums where it's like it's long enough and weird enough that you kind of don't remember like which song is exactly which you know yeah yeah yeah. Um, mm-hmm. and then when it starts you're like oh yeah i love this one right like I, I don't know i've been i've listened to it for so many years and still you know like if i had to like hum the melody right now of motion suggests itself I, i'm not sure i would be like humming the right song or one of the ones near it you know what i mean um and i think that's what kind of gives it that gem quality so on that note, I want to start switching into the reception and legacy stuff I mentioned earlier, but let's kind of like sum up our feelings first. How did it go revisiting or in Dan's case, deep diving for the first time? I mean, what are your feelings on this album? Uh, you know, I it, it was okay. I, I didn't like, I, I was honestly like not looking forward to, to doing this one. This, this is like a record we've been, we got that email like a little bit ago and we've it's been the next episode a couple times and we've had to push it for, <laughs> yeah. for other things. And so I was always like, sort of like, sure, I'll do it. You know, and uh, I'm not going to be happy about it. Um, and it was fine. You know, I, I didn't mind it. I, I don't love it. I, I probably won't ever listen to it again or, wow. or very often or anything. But like I said, Jeez. I mean, it's just, it's just, <laughs> it, it really just feels like something like if I, if I heard this record when I was 16, 17, I probably would, love it right now i probably would love pavement it's just it's just not like where i'm at you know in, in life and, and and stuff anymore you know okay wow well um so breaks my heart but they, yeah, no so no so application teenagers is what he's saying <laughs> yeah. okay yeah but uh but darren you kind of alluded to it earlier that it may have shifted down in your estimation revisiting but how did it go yeah i mean because I felt like last episode when we talked about it, I was like, yeah, definitely Wowie's always my favorite pavement record. Um, and admittedly, I, you know, it's been a little while since I've listened to anything pavement, really. Um, and then there's no necess- there's not really an explanation for that, just kind of the way it is. But, you know, coming back, I, I, I definitely was like, oh, man, I love this song, love this song, on and on. But... You know, I, I just didn't feel as particularly like moved as I feel like I must have when I was really into pavement and stuff. But so then I was like, well, let me check out, you know, Crooked Rain and like try to figure this out or whatever. And I don't know, there was something about just the, you know, maybe the tightness of like Crooked Rain and just how it, it, it just kind of gets right to the point And like the songs are, I mean, every song on that record is just so excellent, so perfect. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. And, you know, you take a song like Range Life, which just feels like it has that like emotional, like musical side. Right. And then even if like Stephen Malcolmus is kind of on this idea of like, maybe you don't take him seriously, but like, I I feel like when he says it, you know, he says whatever the shit he says about like smashing pumpkins like he means that you know and, and, and i just i don't know i kind of latch on to the to that album a bit more uh returning to it than i did with wowie zowie maybe it's just that wowie zowie is too much of the like don't take this seriously at all and crooked rain has yeah. just enough there you know that's weird because i i really felt the opposite and i that's what i would have said is that yeah I like Crooked Rain more because it's like more sincere. Mm-hmm. It's got like really some emotional highlights there. Um, and then I, I revisited that one as well this week. And I just felt like it's too serious. <laughs> like, <laughs> it, it feels a little bit like it just feels maybe a lot closer to that kind of emo rock stuff I was talking sure, about. Yeah. You know, there's time, time and a place for that for sure. But like, I just was finding this album so fun this week and like so fun that I seriously just couldn't stop reading this 33 and third book. I don't know. I don't know what came over me. But I was just like, damn, this is so interesting. And like, I was just listening to the album over and over these last two, you know, usually by the time we record an episode, I'm like so sick of what we're going to talk about, but <laughs> I still, I still am enjoying this so much. I think it is like so much fun. There are some emotional depths, but there's also like just the most hilarious stuff. Um, 
yeah, so for me, it kind of like became my favorite Pavement album this week. Um, and I do think it's a masterpiece. But, you know, as I mentioned at the top, really was met with a, a very mixed reception uh, when it first came out. And maybe it's obvious, but I wonder how you guys would explain, you know, how, how do you account for that? Why, why, did it, why was it met with like such overwhelming disappointment, even from fans? I mean, speaking as somebody who, you know, isn't overly familiar uh, with Pavement, I, th- I think like the disjointedness of it, the, the, the grab bag quality, I-, I could see why, you know, that, that would be a disappointment. Because I, 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 the other two records in, in my recollection aren't, aren't like that at all, right? Right, right. I mean, they're, they're usually considered those kind of like perfect yeah, 10 yeah. type records, you know? Um, yeah, how would, how would you try to explain it, Darren? Yeah, I mean, I, I could totally see why, you know, somebody who comes in to love payment, pavement with like uh, Crooked Rain would just be sort of, uh, you know, befuddled by Wowie Zowie, right? To be, to be the follow up to what is what, you know, what I consider to be like a masterpiece, just a, such a perfect, perfect record. Yeah. Um, this one just doesn't, it just lacks that same sort of you know vision and i I think at first like if you you're just sort of searching for crooked rain you know what i mean and you're not going to find it uh by the time you reach like western homes and i i can understand why somebody might be disappointed by that at first i guess my thing is that there seems to have been a lot of talk about like pavement was like on this certain trajectory like they were about to drop you know the big one um and that everything was poised to like you know, there was so much underground buzz around their first two albums, and now it was time to like make their nevermind or something like that, you know? And there was disappointment that this wasn't that. It wasn't like their, it wasn't them like the cure we talked about, like purposely making disintegration, like, hey, let's make a classic, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And to me, it's like the, the, the reason that that's a problem is that they had already done it they had already made their (laughs) never minds and their disintegrations you know so it's like it i've said this before but like bands that have dropped like these kind of stone cold classics the best thing you can do when it's just going to be impossible to follow follow it up is to make like an exploratory like get a little weird you know what i mean because then you kind of put out this album that like you know, it's like we we talked about it a lot too on the on that 1980s episode where it's like all of Dan's favorite records are like the other favorite. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like the, the <laughs> Sonic Youth sister or like Princess Sign of the Times and stuff. And like, so if you you know, just a note to all bands listening, you know, if you drop <laughs> some of these like 10 out of 10s <laughs> universally acclaimed albums, as I'm sure many of you have, for the next one, <laughs> make a weird and difficult, now, challenging record that will be argued about for eternity. Yeah, I mean to to to, to bring back the the, the Ween comparison, Ween follows up their uh, big label debut with a uh, country record, you know, and and it is right. it's that same like thing. It's because like where do you go? You you don't want to have to like fight, you know, face that uh you know that 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 climb or whatever. So yeah, just do something fucking extra weird, and then uh, everybody's okay with it. Yeah, and it. It, yeah, I, I just think it's like more fun because it's like we've heard the classics, you know, now like let, let's get into like the weird stuff. Um, you know, so I guess we should talk about this kind of theory that is like really the prevailing theory I mentioned that they were kind of like, you know, poised for stardom, poised for like that voice of a generation thing and like backed away from it or something, which is a theory that, you know, I don't buy because I, I think that they genuinely believe that they had already done it. And if you think mm-hmm. about it, as far as like the 90s kind of indie hipster world goes, like pavement are the voice of their generation, you know, like they were already. So, you know, it's like, I think that they were satisfied with the work that they had done and didn't think they needed to try to top it. I mean, do you guys think there's any truth to this, this theory? Yeah, I mean, anytime someone says like a band, you know, purposely like did something bad to, you know, to piss off the fans or something, I always like take that with a grain of salt. It, it seems like maybe it's a defense mechanism for, um, you know, making a record that didn't get the, the acclaim right. that you or wanted. Or from the fans. Yeah. You know, like for the fans who are like, how could they have made a misstep? Oh, they must have done it on purpose. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's just, yeah, exactly. And so I'm always like sort of weary on, on that. Um, 
you know, the big one with Dylan self portrait, you know, kind of thing. Like I, I always like, you know, you want to believe it on, on one hand and, and on the other, you know, cause it makes a good story, but, but then like, would someone really do that? You know? So I, I don't know. I don't know the, the story of pavement well enough. I mean, the nineties, if you were going to do a, a fuck you to the fans kind of record, I feel like the nineties was, <laughs> right. was the time to do it. So that's true. So who knows? True. Yeah. Do you buy this Darren? Yeah, no, I mean, I'm I'm more inclined to believe that, like, Crooked Rain is, like, the pinnacle. Like, they, they did, you know, achieve what yeah. they wanted to do. I, I can't look at that record and try to think of a way that they somehow become more mainstream without them, like, abandoning, <laughs> you know, what makes them pavement. You know what I mean? Like, right. that's the only way I see it going any further into the mainstream. Um, I, I honestly think that this was the... You know, we talk about certain bands and certain records that feel like you're they're on the verge of something big. The, Crooked Rain is not that. Like Crooked Rain is right. is what they wanted to achieve, you know. So Wowie Zowie seems like naturally to be the right thing to do is just to sort of like explore and not try to perfect perfection, you know? Mm. Right, right. Yeah, that, I mean that's that's really how I feel. And there's some investigation into this in the uh 33 and a third book I mentioned, mm-hmm. which is like you know, were you guys getting like major label offers and stuff like that and um were you consciously like, you know, avoiding this and stuff like that and you know, really it, it what's kind of interesting about the book is that a lot of the band members like have different memories of it and i kind of wonder if like malcolmus is in, actually in charge and just the others didn't know that they got they could have been <laughs> signed to a major label and like been millionaires but um it, it does seem to be the case that they that malcolmus just simply wasn't interested in signing a major label deal like he was pretty happy with matador happy with the, the way things were going and that just makes me feel like they were very proud of the work they had done and ready to take a weird left turn right you know what i mean like not trying to capitalize on um or or uh, improve upon what they had already done. Um, do you think that you kind of alluded to it, Dan, with like the self portrait thing, Bob Dylan, like supposedly purposely sabotaging things, you know, do you think this is a real phenomenon? Like it, it gets thrown around a lot that a band is like consciously trying to alienate their fans, you know, talk about like Nirvana's in utero or something, or like consciously trying to back away from the mainstream or, you know, in the case of like, metal machine music it might be true consciously saying fuck you (laughs) to everyone um do you think this is like a real phenomenon that anybody actually does well i mean like like metal machine music i think that was more of a fuck you to the record label um and i do i do i believe that i mean we've talked about that record on our old podcast before but um i think lou reed was at least uh sort of uh genuine about it but i think it definitely was like he knows the record label's not gonna like it kind of thing yeah, you know, Dylan was self-portrait. That's a whole thing. I want to do an episode on it, so uh, you know, I won't get get too into it. But uh, you know, I I don't think uh, like too many people are actually doing that because why? You know, why would you? M- most people aren't going to work on something. I mean, to to make a record, it, it it takes it takes a long time. You know, most people aren't going to work on something that they're like purposely not going to be proud of or not going to like or right, something. Right. You know, I th- I think like like I said a little bit earlier, like. I think like sometimes artists or even the fans themselves, like they don't love it. They, they, you know, like once they see the backlash or whatever, they, they try to like pull back and say, Oh, you know, it was up there, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of making excuses. Again, the nineties is kind of the place that maybe it is true. I do feel like in utero is like purposely like more of a, you know, less commercial record and stuff, but and I think that like that, like in utero is not, not bad at all. I mean, it's, it's many people's favorite Nirvana record. And so I think like, that's, you know, uh, a conscious thing to like kind of go back to their roots or whatever a little bit. And if the fans like it good, if they don't, you know, fuck them, but you know, they ended up, yeah. they ended up liking it and I'm sure Kurt was pretty sure they were going to like it, you know? Um, yeah. So something like this, it, it just sort of feel like, like this record feels like a band just making the songs that they want to make you know that, that that's really what like i i felt not knowing much about the you know the band itself or the mystique around them or anything it just sort of felt like an album of songs of that a band wanted to do and you know that that's like with that what that white album kind of feel we we always talk about i think is yeah 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 what do you think darren yeah i mean i i would totally be just 
beside myself if I if I thought for a second that like you know pavement deliberately created an album to be bad or something like that you know <laughs> I, I just couldn't there's no way you know what i mean like you like dan mentioned like you don't put this much time and effort into something that you don't at least feel satisfied with like a, you know to, to to try to deliberately like dismantle whatever you had built up with like crooked rain no i just think that like again you know they recognize that crooked rain was something that was you know that you're not really going to just be able to top or just repeat right in you know the uh, best way to try to avoid that is to you know explore different areas of the music and try to expand and ra rather than just try to replicate you know yeah and i think another thing is that pavement has this kind of reputation for being like slackers uh like this kind of slacker rock vibe and on some you know on, on one hand i get it because there's a vibe, especially to Wowie Zowie, which is like this. This was probably the first take, you know. Um, a lot of that kind of messiness. Um, there's aspects like, uh, God, which song is it with the? Uh, yeah, yeah. Motion um, suggests itself. Weirdly, it's called Motion Suggests Itself on the reissue, but Motion Suggests on the original. Um, you know, it's got that like kind of you know that I don't know what it's called, but that like Latin percussion where you're like dragging a stick across. Like the ridges on Oh yeah, it starts with a G. I mean, it's like G U I R O. It's how you or, Yeah. You know. Whatever, whatever that is. You know. But it, you just get the feel that like there was one sitting around or something. You know what I mean? Like they didn't like call Matador and be like, We need a we need one of those things in here, like right away. <laughs> you know, like um or like the guy, you know, and even in the book they mentioned like the engineer guy like knew how to play slide. So it was like if he didn't, there wouldn't be any slide on this yeah. album, maybe. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like so I get that, but it all feels purposeful. You know, I think that they're trying to capture like the kind of looseness of a first or second take and that that's like vital to their sound and that you kind of lose the pavement essence if you over practice, you know what I mean? Um, so I don't think that they're slackers at all. We even mentioned like the kind of crazy sequencing here. It feels like there's a logic to it. I, I really do think despite what Malcolm says that he thought about it. Um, so, you know, that just makes me feel like it wasn't like, they were afraid of fame or like didn't want yeah. to take the next step or something. I think they're, they're kind of doing what they wanted to do. Um, so the last question on this is like, how, how do you guys account then for the gradual kind of reappraisal, like the new classic status of Wowie Zowie? How do you think that came to happen? Well, I think like with records like this, that like when people are expecting something and then they get something different, it, it just like always sort of like has a negative reaction at first, just cause like, you know, people, uh. people want crooked rain part two and stuff you know like i mean yeezus had a had a bad uh you know reception from a lot of people at first and then now is re regarded as a classic i think it's just like once once enough times passed and the like you know initial like disappointment of of records like fades away you know when when you realize like like when, when new people come to the record and you know i mean i was like seven when this record came out you know so like it, w me hearing wow he's like, i'm not disappointed in the follow-up to to you know because i didn't i didn't hear that until you know whatever so i think like when you look at it like that way where, where it's not like you when you have no expectations uh, of anything it, it's much easier to like look at the record like as uh, on its own you know not not yeah not like yeah. what i was wanting um you know yeah how would you explain it Darren? yeah i mean i think similar to dan like you know, a follow-up record to what was considered a masterpiece or a really great record, I think gets a lot of immediate attention, right? Um, and some of that ends up being negative if it's not the Crooked Rain part two that you are that you were mm -hmm. expecting. But then upon, you know, retrospect and like looking back and that, that follow-up record is always going to be important because you're going to look at like Crooked Rain and think, yeah, what a great record. Let's talk about the follow-up. And I think as time goes on, you stop thinking about that follow-up as needing to be Crooked Rain Part 2 and rather recognize it for what it is and understanding that, like, you know what, this is actually a damn good record for in its own right, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think that's all true. And I, do, I also think that, like, it, it is the kind of record that I do think takes a little, a little time because it is for about, sure. like, digging into the weird, you know, corners of it. Um, and, you know, I, I think it... You know, it's interesting because like a lot of kind of um, records that are met with a reception like this, people just don't end up returning to them. But I think what becomes clear is that Pavement was still kind of at the peak of their powers here. And so it kind of like 
you know, it gives you that motivation, like to keep digging and keep digging. And, you know, you, you, there's really a lot to find here. So it's like, I personally, you know, just, to, just to repeat it, um, any band at the peak of their powers who wants to drop like a messy, crazy, <laughs> fucked up album like this, like that is my shit. That is what I really, really want. Um, any closing thoughts on Wowie Zowie? We've got a, a, a quick listener email that I've been pushing back a lot. Um, but anything else to add? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, for anybody out there who has never listened to the record, but maybe you've heard of Pavement, I think this is an absolute must listen. Um, if you haven't listened to Pavement at all, I think this alongside Crooked Rain, like, you you know, these are, these both qualify as like must listens for anyone who wants to explore music, you know what I mean? Um, it was once one of my favorite records, maybe it was my favorite Pavement record at one point, now it's really not, but that doesn't change the fact that i think that it's a you know fantastic record incredibly important to their discography and something that you know most people should hear well here here ready to get to an email yeah okay we've pushed this question from jerry back for the sake of time for like the last two episodes or so and even though it was slightly more relevant to like a much earlier conversation i still think it's a really great question first though let me give you one last reminder <laughs> actually there will probably be another reminder yeah i'll have one for you yeah. <laughs> just in a few uh, minutes <laughs> that you too can email us about anything that's on your mind popshieldpod at gmail.com okay jerry writes one of the most prevalent themes of music in the 2010s was nostalgia, whether it was for the 80s with synthwave and new disco or for the 90s with vaporwave. Paradoxically, as our music technologies and capabilities for producing new sounds got better, we became more enamored with the sound of the past rather than exploring new possibilities. Why do you think this is? And do you see this trend continuing into the 2020s? What do you think about that? You know, I mean, it is a, it is a really good point. I, I think my answer sort of i don't know but it, it's just like something with our like age of of people you know like the the millennial like we we've got this like nostalgia kick you know like what what people uh you know love like like movies that were big when we were kids you know like you know teenage mutant ninja turtles or, or space jam and, and stuff like that uh it's just like for some reason it and I don't, I, it just doesn't feel like other generations were ever like that. And maybe it's because like we have the access to it, you know, like, like if I want to go watch Space Jam, I can do that. Whereas, you right, know, right. I, I don't know what movie my dad liked when he was a kid, but <laughs> you know, he, he's old enough where he didn't have a VCR until I was born, you know, so he couldn't go and, you know, watch whatever, you know, movie. Um, so I think it, it's maybe yeah. like our, our, our access to it. And then, I mean, even like, you know, people a little bit uh, younger than us you know you can still sort of like get into you know space jam because you can you can watch it you know you could you could have heard about it or something and uh and, and go and find it whereas again like you know my dad probably couldn't have easily watched whatever his dad was into when he was a kid you know it probably wasn't into anything because i don't think tvs were around but you know what i mean <laughs> You know, it's just like we we have this like ability to be so nostalgic. Like we we, we just like are actually like surrounded by it. You know, I mean, yeah. sitting in front of me, you know, on my phone, I can listen to almost any album from any era ever. You know, like since, since right. re, you know recorded music. Uh, whereas, like again, that's something like our parents and and especially grandparents like you couldn't really do i mean you had to sp one spend money for it you had to like find it uh you know it's well, just, it's just I mean, a much more difficult thing do you have an explanation then like why it seemed to be the 80s specifically that people were latching on to i don't because you know he mentions like the 90s with vaporwave to me i associate vaporwave more with the 80s like i mean it, you know that kind of shitty 80s soft rock yeah stuff. yeah i mean i i think of vaporwave as like the music of the 80s but sort of like the um the the graphics of the night yeah, you know that that, that neon thing yeah. and then yeah it's always like that that you know uh microsoft 98 kind of kind of like yeah. vibe to it and stuff uh, but i i don't know i guess it's because like all that stuff sort of like has uh it's, it's like a retro futurism you know like a lot of 80s things uh yeah kind, kind of like looks at like the the future world you look like blade runner or something where it's like it, it, it's this like future but like they didn't have the foresight to like like it like in blade runner the, the computer screens are still right. like you know they're not like graphic interfaces it, it's like were you know like that green on black you know kind of kind of yeah. typing it's, or it's like really funny like i went to disney uh not too long ago i guess 
maybe the last time I'll get to go before uh, the apocalypse has started now. But um, <laughs> you know that 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 Tomorrowland, you know, yeah, like yeah, so it's, comically, <laughs> it's like so old. It's future, so right? obviously built in like 1974, <laughs> you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and I think like that's something. I mean, I love I I, I love uh, Philip K. Dick, like the the writer, um, and and he's the one who broke the book that blade runners on but like um you know his whole thing like all uh, most of his stuff was like written in the 60s and 70s and it does it, it all like takes place in like 2020 or 2050 or something yeah. and it's like flying cars but like people still have like i i, I read one uh th this past week and like a fax machine was like a big portion of it <laughs> but like in this book they're like they're living on mars and uh yeah. you know flying cars and stuff but like a fax machine you know and it's just We're like, still like using fax machines <laughs> it is just like such a like i don't know it's like I, I i love that like sort of retro futurism sort of thing like it's just like looking at like what people thought the future was and then just like getting it right uh you know sort of but like just missing these like comical things you know yeah so maybe like an interest in looking at you know <laughs> what we pers like we are living in the future that was imagined for us in previous media exactly so like kind of a weird self-fulfilling prophecy thing happening um how would you explain this darren yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the points that Dan made um, were exactly right. You know, I, I think that the fact that we have this sort of access and we can leverage this technology to go back to the things that we remember um, remember as a kid or growing up, I, I mean, there's no doubt that, like, nostalgia sells. You know, we've, we've talked about this in numerous ways in various forms of media, like, nostalgia sells. You know what I mean? You see... You see movies being uh, remade. You see video games being remastered and revived. Mm -hmm. you, you know, it's just everywhere. Like, because people, you know, are so connected, so deeply connected to these things that they, you know, feel rooted yeah. to, like, in, in their childhood and, and growing up, um, that, you know, while there are opportunities to explore new areas and new things, there is still a desire to go back and relive it and, and you know all the points that you made about how like our parents just didn't have access to that. So everything that they were getting was just new and just constantly, you know, treading, you know, onto new ground and everything. It's just been different for us. Now, as far as like what I think the 2020s will bring, you know, I think that at some point nostalgia is going to catch up to us and there's no longer going to be any, you know, area to explore that's old anymore. It's already mm. been explored again. Right. So I think, our only choice is to move forward. And I think that the next generation of, um, of music listeners and stuff are going to be less interested in this nostalgia game and more interested in pushing forward into newer, newer and newer things. But what if they become nostalgic for our current nostalgia? They probably will. They will. <laughs> I mean, cause for me, cause think about it like this, like I'm a little like conflicted on this question because on one hand, like, the 2010s was really like a, a very electronic decade, like we've talked about. Um, I think it was the, it was sort of technological as a lot of these like sounds are often determined by the available technologies, you know? And so you've got a lot of people like with computer programs that can make, you know, very sophisticated sounds and are very affordable. Um, and if you really think about it, like I think a lot of music looks back um, on previous music for inspiration. And if you make electronic music, what the fuck are you going to look back to? The Beatles? True, like, yeah. You're going to look, you can you're only look, look back, back at the so first far, electronic yeah. music. Yeah, the 80s is as far back as you can go, pretty much. Um, and so, to me, that that just seems to, like, make a certain sense. And honestly, what you guys were just talking about with this, like, kind of, like, I don't know, think about, like, the 70s, right? Like, the Ramones, they're kind of, like, nostalgic for, but reinventing 50s. Yeah, pop, exactly. Okay? And then you get to the 90s who are nostalgic for and reinventing the punk rock that was nostalgic for and reinventing the fifties rock, you know, 20 mm -hmm. years early. It seems like almost like a 20 year thing kind of, um, on the other hand, I don't know if I would use the word nostalgia necessarily because I do think that there became a fascination in this last decade with the eighties because the eighties suck. Like i really genuinely think this, like it's a, almost like a <laughs> artistic crisis in the eighties that they kind of overwhelmingly suck ass. and. I think there became this, it starts almost with Vaporwave, like this fascination with how much it sucked. You know what I mean? Like this shit is so bad. Like it's so cheesy and corporate and soft and like crap. 
And it, you know, we talked about before, like a lot of these movements, they start kind of like ironically, you know, like uh, you seek out something that's like, there's a niche because it's hated, it's not widely listened to, and you kind of like get interested despite that, you know? So, mm-hmm. I mean, you think about like the first time I heard like the war on drugs or something, I'm like, okay, so their big inspiration is like, 80s dylan like what the fuck but it it makes perfect sense you know because every generation like looks for the unmined potential in something that the their the generation they grew up in didn't like you know what i mean yeah um so i think there's a little bit of that like rebelliousness now as far as you kind of touched on a little bit darren but do you have any predictions dan for the 2020s like if we're moving i don't know if, if this last decade was kind of obsessed with the 80s Will we do like a '90s thing? Or... I've, I've been saying it. No one wants to hear it. <laughs> new metal, new metal's coming back. I, it, it, you know, this this is not going to be a great decade. We were starting off on a bad <laughs> foot. Wow. Starting with coronavirus, ending with new yeah, metal. That's true. You know, so yeah. so bunker bunker down. <laughs> so quarantine yourself yeah. from the from from music. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's kind of already already uh, happening a little bit with that. Uh, God, what is that? Um, like. Uh, Poppy. Poppy, yeah. Oh my god, yeah. Very new metal. And there's like a little bit of that. There's like another artist that Anthony Fantana loves that kind of does that thing. Um, it is starting to happen. At the same time, you know, it, also, doesn't it feel like the people who who are like 18 now, they grew up listening to like early 2000s music. So could we see like Animal Collective become cool again? Yeah, that's, that's true. Oh god. <laughs> <laughs> We're old. That's That's what he's saying, basically. <laughs> animal yeah, collective yeah, stuff- becomes dad rock <laughs> oh my god well that's kind of how it goes though isn't it because it's like i, I mean yeah like, it, uh, it basically is because i'm trying to i'm trying to like do the math in my head but like dads were like i don't just feel like the 80s like the late 80s had a little like the hair metal thing was kind of like hey you remember zeppelin you know what i mean like let's do it again man like mm-hmm. music sucks now fuck madonna fuck prince like let's do some like rock you know and like we could be in for one of those. So we'll be the dads who are like, damn, man, this, this is like Animal Collective, man, when music rocks. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe we'll be like, it's like Korn, man, when music was yeah. not that great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, okay, you got to, you've got a good option there and a bad option. So uh, I guess decide what, based on, you know, whether you see the glass half full or half full. <laughs> All right. Well, what do you think? We'd love to read your thoughts on air. Like we promised you one more plug. Email us popshieldpod at gmail.com. Next episode. I don't know why I say it. We're not sure. We never are. (laughs) If you like the show, help us out. Subscribe. Leave a five-star review wherever you get your podcast. Stay connected. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all that junk at popshieldpod. And we'll see you in two weeks. See you. So long.